everybody. Welcome to FEI Freight Executive Insights. I am not the freight executive with the insights, but I do have the leading advisor and investor to supply chain. It's uh, Mr. Benjamin Gordon. He is managing partner and CEO of Cambridge Capital, if you don't know. I've known him for a number of years. I consider him a good friend of mine. He considers me a you know, somebody he might run into in the street and say hi, I think, something like that. Anyway, doesn't matter. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? Great to see you, Michael. I would definitely say more than hi on the street. I, I understand. Yeah, there might be a few choice words that, well, we could say them here. This is a podcast. We're allowed to say whatever we want, aren't we? I mean, who's going to stop us? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who would stop us. I have the slightest idea. Uh, it's an interesting time right now. And I've talked to a lot of freight executives have several different opinions about why we're in this deeper trough and why there's not this mass exodus of of uh, of, of capacity to keep up with the recession of freight. Uh, and I'd love your opinion on, on what's going on here, Ben. Well, I, look, we have nine portfolio companies in supply chain, so I have a few data points for what's going on. You, you, you asked how things were going, and I'm, I'm reminded of the old expression, in a word, good. And in two words, <laughs> not good. <laughs> uh, and the reality is, look, we're, we're doing great. Our portfolio is doing great and, and you know, looking forward to an exciting year. But this, is, this has been a, a challenging time for everybody in the freight business. And I think, um, you know, there, there are a few, a few key pieces. One is, I mean, you alluded to what's happening in the freight cycle. And, you know, I mean, freight rates peaked. Uh, February of 22, and they've, they've really dropped about 50% since then, seem to be bottoming them out, starting to come back up. You know, we see that we have, you know, a couple of freight companies, freight and logistics companies, BOA and Everest. Uh, we have a couple of companies in freight and analytics and, and data, green screens. Um, and, you know, the data suggests that things are starting to get better. Um, oh, good. And, and so that's, that's a good sign, um, number one. And, and I, I, I would point to a couple of things. One is freight rates themselves. Uh, two is um, the the stabilization. Let's well the exits of capacity, which are still probably less than they need to be, but but more than they were at this time last year. Right. Um, and then third is the psychology. So look, bottom line, I think things are starting to improve. The other thing that I would say, Michael, is when you look at the uh, the performance of, of companies in this arena. I mean, it's interesting. Um, last year, if if you were a, a freight, you know, logistics company, truck brokerage company, and you were down, you know, 40%, 50%, that was in line with market. So if you were down less than that, you know, you were winning. Um, and now, look, we're starting to see some growth. I mean, our companies, I mean, just, you know, Everest, for example, uh, you know, we just had a board meeting and, you know, numbers are up, you know, year to date versus last year. And, uh, I think that's reflective of both their their performance and their their good decisions, as well as uh, the market conditions. So, that's look, encouraging. I think for a number of reasons, I think things are starting to get better. Yeah, that's encouraging. It's it's interesting when they look at it. So, I mean, like last year, the the the, the downward trends, right? I saw people, you know, and and quite notably from large large companies like you know like Brown, like UPS, right? Hey, we're down thirty percent from last year. I'm like, well. Okay, duh. Is that why? Why is that an alarm bells? I mean, hello. It was like you know the most anomalously high years ever. Uh, so if you're down from those, but still up from 18 or even 19, then that's pretty good because 19 was a crappy year and 20 was not shaping up to be very good before the shutdown, right? I mean, it was. I, I remember you know, they, they were talking about rate floors for uh, you know in trucking. Right. <laughs> and, and all the all the brokerage houses were screaming, hey, we're going out of business in January of 2020. Um, and then and then things quickly changed, as, as we know. But right now, when you look at that data, and you see that it's encouraging. Are they the same data points that you look at before or has nearshoring, friend shoring or the precise data and the proliferation of the need and gathering of that data kind of changed or made your predictive modeling through those through those data points more accurate? Yeah. So there are some things that are different now. It's not all apples to apples. And I mean, like like the joke about the guy that, that drowned in a river that was an average of six inches deep, uh, you know, you can you can play games with what data snapshots that you take. Sure. Um, 
what what I look at, I mean, look, a, a few things. One, I look at the kind of the overall basket of data for you know for truckload in particular. Look at it for LTL. Look at it for other modes. Um, two, uh, I look at it for point to point where there's some consistency, right? I mean, LA to Chicago is a consistent lane, you know, so you, you have a little more precision that way. Three, um, you know, I also look at the the kind of the differentiating from the average versus the, the little pockets of opportunity. I mean, we all know that, for example, cross-border, you know, as you put it, nearshoring, friendshoring, the fact that Mexico has supplanted China as the U.S.'s largest trade partner, uh, so there's more trade activity there. So, you know, lo- looking at the and actually, there, there's been consistent growth even through the freight recession in U.S. Mexico. The issue is how much growth at what rate, and is it enough to offset yeah. everything else? But the, the the one other thing that Michael, I think, is worth noting: we are awash in data, um, and it's it's interesting to note that I, mean, I had this conversation with somebody where you know we were talking about the fact that I pointed out that this is the worst freight recession in history, and he said, "Well, how can that be?" And I said. Well, uh, we have really good data since 1980. Um, and he said, well, what about before 1980? I said, well, guess what? Believe it or not, before 1980, there was no such thing because prices were fixed. They were set by the government. It wasn't until- Yeah, it was regulated. Exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, we, we, we may talk about politics and the impact on, on uh, transportation and logistics. The least, the least likely thing that you could say is that- uh, Jimmy Carter was responsible for deregulation and transportation. It seems insane, given that it's the exact opposite of everything else that he did. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, deregulation in 1978 through 1980, whether it was in trucking, railroads, airlines, you know, you name it, um, is what allowed us to have variability in pricing instead of the government fixing the rate. So on the one hand, that's great because it created all this opportunity, right? I mean, sure. truck brokerage as an industry wouldn't exist if you couldn't price discriminate between good lanes and bad, where you're going into a market where there's, you know, likely to be backhaul or not. But on the other hand, uh, you know, prices wouldn't, wouldn't have plunged like they did in the last two years. So, you know, I think that's, uh, that's, that's the reality. We are awash in data and we are awash in volatility. Mostly that's a good thing. Uh, but the, the pain of the last two years illustrates that it's not always a good thing. Yeah. Well, I, I, it, it appears to me that it's a good thing if everybody's paying attention, right? And, 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 and realizes that winter comes every year. It's like a season that happens annually, right? And, yeah. I, and, I, and I use that as a, a cycles in trucking because it always seems like we forget that, wait a minute, it, it's going to come back down. And so irresponsible growth, I'll say, happens and, and causes the next cycle to react, right? So like how you react in this cycle as an industry sets up how the next, how big of an impact the next cycle might have. Would you agree with that kind of statement? Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, the, the trough of 2019 led to the boom of 2021, 22, which led to the trough of the last two years. And uh, of course, I mean, it's, it's yeah. funny. Uh, uh, Michael, I'll tell you one other interesting thing about that. Um, some industries we thought, just always went up and they weren't cyclical. And then what happened was we realized that as they, as they succeeded and their market share got bigger, um, they became subject to the laws of, of the cycle. And a great example of that, first company that I started, 3Plex, was a SaaS TMS company 25 years ago. And mm-hmm. you know, up until that point, tran- well, not just transportation, but software as a whole had gone up just about every year for the prior 20 years. So what mm. happens in 2021? 2021, excuse me, 2001, um, we have this recession. Really, it started in April of, of 2000, but uh, software recession of 2001, 2002. And what happened was, and w- one of uh, you know w- one of the venture capital firms in, in Boston that, that, that I, I got to know well showed me this graph, and he said, "Look, capital goods, there's a predictable cycle, right? So if you've got big industrial machinery." You know, if you're like John Deere, Caterpillar, uh, you know, you're up in good times, down in bad times. Well, it turns out that software and technology as a whole is a part of the capital goods arena, but it was such a tiny percentage of market share that nobody realized it. And there's been such tremendous growth in software that all of a sudden, by around the year 2000, 2001, it had gotten too big to not be subject to the cycles. Well, that's the exact same thing that's just happened with freight brokerage. 
when freight brokerage mm. 30 years ago was a negligible, you know, a couple of percent of the total freight industry, we could live through the ups and downs. And if you were C.H. Robinson or anybody else, you were going to do fine no matter what. Well, now freight brokerage is about 25 percent of the total trucking market. And, and so with that level of penetration, guess what? When the market falls, you fall, too. So I think that's really uh, another layer to what's going on. Yeah, it is. And uh, along that same point, um, I, I've spoken to those who who and I kind of think that there's some merit to this, that part of the reason that we haven't seen um, as fast a decline in capacity or as big of an, a, an exit. And I know there's a couple of different reasons for that, but one of those uh, would be the proliferation of the brokers, right? And, and the, the technology that they've brought to the table over the last 10 years makes them a very viable service option for the large companies who, like you said, 20, 30 years ago would drop them into Greece really quickly to keep the enterprise carrier on them. Well, now that service difference isn't really there, right? It would, is, is that a, a portion of it? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, right. It used to be that freight brokers were like the, the, either the scrappy upstarts or, or the solution for just a small piece of the market. And guess what? Yeah. Freight brokerage has matured and as the expectations of shippers has matured and people have come to realize the value that they bring. Yeah, that, the, that growth in outsourcing. And that's the other thing that's worth mentioning. Outsourcing as a category has also gotten so much bigger. So if you right. think about it, uh, not to nerd out, but uh, you, were, you and I were talking about uh, guitars behind us and other things behind us. I got some books behind me that uh, one of which is about um, uh, it's a book called Outsourcing the Corporation by Hamel and Prahala. That book came out around 33 years ago, and it basically... It was based on the premise that, as Jack Welch said, your back office is somebody else's front office. So somebody mm. else is going to do a better job at the thing that you don't really care about. And that led right. to outsourcing everything, IT, HR, and, of course, also logistics. So people have now gotten used to the fact that the guy who's doing truck brokerage for you, he's not just a guy that might be a fallback. He might actually be better at it than the people in your organization if you're an enterprise because... Uh, it's not your core business, right? If you're a manufacturer, your core business is is what you make or what you brand, not the logistics associated with it. So why not outsource it to a specialist? So I think that mentality has really taken root over the last two decades. And that's part of what's allowed logistics to become so successful, but also such a big part of the market that it's a subject to the cycle as well. Yeah, it's really interesting to see because, you know, I remember back in my roadway days, which was right after deregulation, one of the differentiators that we had was we would actually put an employee on site with a big enough company. And that was kind of your, you know, that that was kind of our TMS of the day, right? Yeah. <laughs> was yeah. A guy with a with a cell. Well, he didn't even have a cell phone. He had a phone and a fax machine, right? what it was back in those times. And that was I gotta, your TMS. I got to ask you about that, Michael. I mean, first of all, there's no way you're that old because- I am. You are. All right. Well, whatever you, it must be the guitar. So keep doing it. It's thir- it well, it's the guitars. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, musicians can be well pickled. It, it can be done. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I've 36 years in logistics I've, I've got. So Thank yeah, you. I've been around it a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, the guitar. And you got one back there. What is that guitar, by the way? Is that a, an acoustic or electric? What is it? Uh, well, I've got two. I mean, the, the electric is a Fender Stratocaster. Oh, and, nice. Uh, you know, you probably got one of the, it looks similar. I, what do you have behind you? I got a Stratocaster right here. There you go. That's what I thought. A blacked out, a blacked out and I got a Telecaster over here. Excellent. Excellent. Well, my guess is you'll play both of them better than I will because uh, I took it up late in life and, and I've been on the DL for, for the last year with an elbow injury. So, uh, Ooh. we'll save the jam session yeah. for, for, uh, some practice time. Yeah. My best jam sessions are with the turned up stereo and a beer and maybe whiskey. That's it. <laughs> That's too early for that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wait, it's way too early right now. So let me ask you this about, about nearshoring it, et cetera, and, and what's going on. Um, so, you, you know, when before the the in 2018 or the beginning, you know, the 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 the, the Trump trade wars, et cetera, right? It was interesting to watch 
you know, Cambodia become the uh, the Christmas like capital of the world, like overnight. Right. Is, is that sort of, <laughs> is that sort of thing occurring through Mexico? And if so, or if not, how does that affect the wild swings in inventory, et cetera? Theoretically, you would not have to have a, a six month, you know, order or booking of containers to get your materials from Mexico. And therefore, there should not be these wildly off target inventory purchases. Yeah. Well, I think, Michael, there are a couple of parts to that. One is, Yes, people are shifting their manufacturing from China to wherever else they can go, whether it's Mexico or Malaysia or, or somewhere else. Problem is that's easier said than done, right? It's not like yeah. it's not like uh, you know the stock market, like you're going to sell Apple and, and buy Microsoft or, or, or something. It's it's a multi-year process to shift yep. manufacturing and shift supply chains. Number one, and then number two, some of these markets are just too small. I mean, I remember talking with an institutional investor about this and said, well. You know, won't this just be great for the supply chains of markets like Vietnam uh, because people will shift? And I said, yeah, sure. But do you know how big the economy of Vietnam is versus China? Uh, I mean, yeah. I think it's less than one one hundred. And so um, you can't just automatically shift industrial capacity like that. So so number one, that that does add volatility. Right. As you point out, because it's not so easy and it adds complexity. And then number two, um, remember that. Uh, we, for the last 40 years, supply chain professionals have been saying, uh, reduce your inventory, you know, run lean, lean supply chains will, you know, will help you, uh, you know, leverage supply chain expertise to make more money. Well, we all saw in, during COVID, the trade-off between just in time and just in case. And, and so I think there's been this, uh, kind of swings, pendulum swing back and forth between too little and too much and, and, and then back in the other direction. And uh, I think companies are, are still feeling that out. The last thing that I'll say is um, that that got to be so bad that there were companies, I mean, for example, major retailers, uh, you know, companies like um, uh, American Eagle and, and mm. uh, Home Depot buying their own supply chain capacity, whether that was acquiring right. logistics companies or buying ships or, or, or otherwise. Now, that doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense in the long run. But in the short run, when you're feeling all this pressure because of shortages, uh, you know, I, I get how those kinds of decisions could get made. I think you're going to see a lot of those decisions get unwound over the next you know, two to four years. But coming back to yeah. the core issue that you raised. Yeah, I think we're we're going to have more volatility and more shortages, uh, you know, until people sort of find where, where they want to be in, in the midst of that pendulum swing. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe JB Hunt got a, a nice fire sale on some intermodal equipment from a major retailer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In, in recent right. history. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, good for you, Shelley. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So let me ask you this. As you look forward and you're you're you know, in your advisory investment, et cetera, how how much does um you know, you talked about it before and it, it, you know, with Jack Welch, you know, your front office, somebody else's back office or your back office is somebody else's front office is actually how it goes. Right. Um, but uh, so let's let's apply um, scopes of emissions to that and sustainability. How, how important is that becoming in your estimation, looking at companies that you would invest in as new companies or advising those that exist is this a, a topic that 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 comes up and how much weight is is placed on it in those inner conversations i mean sustainability comes up a lot more in discussions for me at least in europe uh in canada you know than it does in the u.s um uh -huh. not that people don't care but you know it's, it's a it's a question of priorities right i mean do you believe in sustainability like you know who, who in the right mind wouldn't say yes then the question is okay how much are you willing to pay for it? And and that's where you know where, where things get uh, you know get interesting. Um, yeah, I do believe it's possible to have both, and I think that's part of the premise behind some of these supply chain technology companies that can both make money and also make supply chains more efficient. Um, and you know whether that's in kind of traditional areas like freight brokerage. You know, I mean, let's face it, if the average truck. Uh, if, if truck utilization is basically 60%, which means 40% of all truck miles are empty, 
um, a good logistics company should be able to squeeze that out and help on the one hand make money for themselves and their customers and their carriers and on the other hand uh, reduce the empty miles which you know should be good for sustainability right that's that's kind of a conventional way of thinking about it then there are other ways I mean we have a company called reverse logics which is really software that specializes in returns management well that's a big deal mm -hmm. for sustainability because if you can make returns more efficient that means that uh, number one, uh, less gets landfill, right? Let's get less gets trashed and and the all the you know sustainability harm that, that flows from that. Uh, secondly, you ought to be able to make more money, right? I mean, the logistics company in this case, Reverse Logics, the uh, re returns management software helps take labor out of the process, makes supply chains more efficient. Think of it as like a WMS for returns. So it makes labor more efficient. You have a more organized way of processing returns. That's great if you're a 3PL like a FedEx or a brand like an Amherst Sports or somebody else that's using that. Um, and then it should be good for the consumer, for you and me, because uh, it should mean that either um, you know, costs come down because there's less waste in the supply chain, uh, or maybe we, you know, we, we don't have to buy as much stuff that doesn't get used. I mean, it should be good for everybody. Reverse Logic is just one example, but there's some great companies that allow you to use software to make the world better and, and also make money. I mean, you should be able to do both. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So Ben, what are you, what are you looking for now? I've got a lot of people that are, well, let me ask you this. What, what are you looking for now? But, uh, or what do you think the market looks like now? Where is it going? Because there's this now kind of softening in, in LTL that has been fairly recent in my discovery, talking to LTL people as uh, seeing it. And usually that's one of those things that say, oh, this trough's pretty sticky when that hits, right? But you're starting to see upward trends. Are you seeing the same thing in, in LTL? Or do you pay attention a lot to LTL as a, as a uh, kind of a, a gauge as to where everything else is? I do. Uh, I do. And also, I mean, look, I was involved in the in the beginning of XPO. I mean, I worked with we worked with Brad Jacobs, helped him develop a plan, co-invested with him in the uh, acquisition of Express One that became XPO. Um, and so, yeah, I'm still a shareholder and and uh, still have a stake in in the success of XPO as well as its derivative, you know, businesses X, uh, uh, GXO and RXO and. Um, and then, you know, look, also uh, Rob Estes and the folks at Estes Express, who, you know, who sure. we very highly of and, you know, spend time with. And, and uh, so the short answer is yes, I do pay attention to LTL. Um, I think there's look, clearly last year was an amazing year for the LTL category, uh, but primarily it's because of yellow. I mean, you know, it's sad to say, you know, you're, you're uh, where, where you started your career, you know, with the guys at Roadway, when, when yellow went bankrupt yeah. last year, all that capacity, it really did three things. One is took out a lot of uh, low cost freight. Um, two is a lot of volume shifted. And then three is uh, it, it created bargaining power for the, uh, you know, for really what's now an oligopoly of, you know, the handful of majors in LTL. And so yeah, if you look at the stock market, that was the best performing category in logistics last year and LTL as a category was up about something like 60%. So now it, it dropped uh, by a meaningful amount last month. So we have an index. So uh, BGSA, uh, our investment bank, puts out a monthly index, the BGSA supply chain index, um, and it dropped last month uh, with the, the biggest contributor to that drop being the LTL basket. And, and so, um, so look, I, but again, I think some of that's pendulum, right? May, maybe some, you know, some freight's getting repriced and some things that if you were a shipper and you were using yellow and it was, you know, last summer or fall, uh, you were going to pay whatever it took to make sure that somebody else stepped in to move your freight. And so, yeah, um, yeah. maybe some of that's and, just and a lot of those were probably what we used to call poorly priced freight because you weren't allowed to call it ugly freight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, but but yeah, because because it, it's kind of when a truckload starts to shrink, there's usually a, a boon in an LTO because you start getting those you start getting those uh, you know spot market volume contracts and in two or three, four, five, six uh, pallet shipments and so on and so forth as the economy starts to slow down and hits it's a truckload. But on the reverse side, when we hit the massive 
you know, straight up a cliff to the moon increase in truckload right after, you know, spring of, of 20, uh, it did the same thing. It'll do the same thing. Those, those volumes will start bleeding over into LTL. And if you're not a sharp LTL pricing analyst, you'll, you'll can lose your shirt on those volume <laughs> spot market contracts because they're not there to increase volume. They're there to fill space <laughs> and pay for fuel. Right. So it's exactly. a different story. Your so your your portfolio did 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 quite well. Is that because you're a good guesser, or was the um, the companies you in, involved in did they do something special? Where they what did, what did they do that you can share through this uh, downturn and trough that that made them more resilient? Well, I think there are, there are different different stories in different cases. For Reverse Logics, Reverse Logics has really built a business that is the market leader in returns management. And if you think about it, you've got a TMS, a WMS, an OMS. Uh, over time, we believe you're going to have an RMS, returns management system. So uh. they built the software to do that end to end. And that's tremendously valuable and compelling, whether it's for a logistics company that can manage uh, returns for their customers or a retailer or brand that has the, the pain point of, of these returns that they want to reduce or otherwise. So I think you know, for reverse logics, it was a function of continuing to focus on doing one thing really well. Same thing with green screens. I mean, that one thing is AI for predictive pricing and trucking and, you know, particularly for logistics companies. And so um, they've now got $25 billion of freight flowing through their system. And, you know, AI is one of those things that everybody likes to talk about, uh, but not everybody knows what it actually is. And what it actually right. is, is a data model that when you train it with more and more data, it gets more and more powerful. And so Green Screens has $25 billion of freight training that data model to get better and better at predicting what the cost should be, you know, for a, you know, a, a, a truckload of freight that gets shipped. And so, again, specializing in something, doing one thing really well, you know, that business, you know, more than doubled last year. Uh, and and uh, again, because I think they're solving a real problem, a real pain point that people have. And I'll give you a third example. Um, I mean, and, and you can look across, uh, I mean, the, the whole portfolio, there are different areas. In tech-enabled logistics, um, we have a company in Latin America called Liftit. And Liftit, you know, look, tech-enabled logistics is something we've seen lots of in the U.S., and you know, you could you could say that companies like Coyote, you know, Coyote was a pioneer in tech enabled logistics uh, and, of course, did tremendously well. There haven't been as many in markets outside the U.S., although that's changing. Uh, Liftit really has emerged as a winner in tech enabled logistics, particularly for middle mile and last mile in Latin America. And so, in you know, we're talking about cross border. Well, in Mexico, Colombia, Ecuador, they're, they're a market leader in multiple markets you know, throughout the region. And. You know, for them, part of it was bringing top tier qualities, capabilities and service levels to a market that doesn't have that many other companies that can perform at that level. That helped them separate from the pack and helps them win some of the blue chip customers in, in that market. So in the end, what do those three things all have in common? They're totally different businesses, but they all exhibit niche leadership in their specific fields. And I think that's, um, by the way, one of the things that I learned from XPO and from Brad Jacobs is, you know, Brad was really good at trying to focus on who's the best in one particular area. When you looked at the acquisitions that XPO made, um, they were consistently targeting someone that was great at one thing. They didn't buy the guy that was doing five things and was pretty good at all of them. It was no, mm. let's buy New Breed because they're amazing at contract logistics for tech and telecom, right? Let's buy uh, you know, the, the Conway business, because they're a market leader in LTL or Menlo in contract logistics and in, in, in their arena or Pacer and in, in intermodal. And so picking leadership niche by niche um, is something that we really tried to do. And that's what we look for when we look for new platforms. Excellent. Excellent. So, Ben, what can you share with us on your uh your uh, thoughts as we go through 2024? You see the uh, trough on an uptick here by the end of the year or, or next year? Or what do you, what do you think? Um, I think we've hit the bottom. I think things are starting to get better already. I think it's a question of how long and how fast. I mean, you know, the joke is that people have been saying, 
we're six months away from recovery for <laughs> for 18 months. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, so so uh, infusion is the energy of the future and it always exactly. will be. Just keep repeating. <laughs> it. Exactly right. If you keep repeating it, eventually you'll be right. So uh, that's right. I do think we have hit bottom. I do think that the data shows that, again, pricing is starting to improve. Capacity is starting to tighten. Uh, I think all that's good. But look, I also think, I mean, for me, you know, Cambridge Capital invests across all areas of supply chain. So while we care about freight and, of course, you know, multiple companies that are tied to, you know, the the freight ecosystem, um, you know, we have companies in different areas as well. Reverse Logics, you know, is really independent of the freight cycle. Reverse Logics is really more a function of the fact that um, as more and more people buy things online, the pain of returns gets higher and higher and the desire to get it right gets, uh, you know, gets to be more and more significant. Similarly, we're announcing an, a, a new investment tomorrow. Uh, and it's a company that pr- helps brands reduce their, uh, the fees that retailers charge them. So for example, if you were P&G or some other major brand and you do business with Walmart, if you don't deliver on time and in full, you get charged an OTIF fee, you know, an on, on time mm-hmm. full fee. Well, those fees add up. I mean, for Walmart, those are over $2 billion a year. And think about that across all the other retailers. And, and so, you know, you're dealing with, a, uh, you know, a, a market that's in the tens of billions, you know, worldwide. It's a big problem. Uh, so we just invested in a terrific company that focuses on helping brands reduce those costs make their supply chains more efficient and reduce the, the fee exposure associated with that. Great business doesn't have anything to do with whether freight is up or down. It's more about solving a problem. And I think, you know, for, for us, the main idea is if you back great people who are solving real problems, um, then the freight cycle shouldn't be, uh, you know, sh- should, shouldn't be that big a deal, you know, whether it's on the upside or the downside. Yeah. 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 You got to, you got a hedge, so to speak, I would imagine, right? Kind yeah, of, exactly. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Ben, I appreciate it so much being on the show, man. If you're not listening to Ben, I don't know who the hell you're listening to. I do. I follow him on LinkedIn. You can find him there. Where else can people follow you, Ben? And 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 who should be reaching out to you? Well, you can find, as you said, LinkedIn handle is Ben Gordon 18. Twitter handle is Benjamin H. Gordon. You can certainly go if you uh, go to the Cambridge Capital site or, or BGSA site, uh, there's there's lots of content there as well. And in terms of who, look, I think uh, we love talking to and working with great CEOs building great businesses in all areas of supply chain. So wherever that is, you know, whether that's truck brokerage or freight forwarding or warehousing or supply chain technology or, you know, asset side or, or non, you know, you name it. Um, if you are building a great business in supply chain, you know, would, would love to talk with you. Cambridge generally invests 10 to 50 million in companies. If they're in software, they're generally doing five to 20 million of revenue of ARR. If they're services companies, generally five to 20 million of EBITDA. Um, uh, but flexible on, on size, as long as you are doing something great. We're interested, and would certainly. You're looking. You're looking for startups and that type of stuff as well. Or are you already established? Well, it's it's a combination of growth and buyouts. Startups that have something gotcha. great that ha- already have some major customers and you know five million plus of revenue. Great startups that are just kind of early in their in their beginning that are you know more seed stage. Love those guys. We love to give them visibility. We have our annual conference, the BGSA Supply Chain Conference, where we give companies the chance to participate in the Shark Tank competition. And so guys that are building something great that are earlier than $5 million of revenue, uh, while Cambridge may not be the right investor, we, we are glad to give them the opportunity to get some visibility uh, you know, through the conference. But what we're love generally it. investing in is, is later stage. Ben, awesome to have you on. I really appreciate my friend. Everybody, thank you for watching FEI Freight Executive Insights. We'll see you next time. Peace and love, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Great to see you.